Well, Robert, welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you, you for sparing time, which I know is an absolutely packed schedule to, to talk welcome to Welcome to journalism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've lived and worked in the Middle East for what, 30, 32, 32 years. years. 32 years yeah. You have an intimate knowledge of the region. How do you think the West has handled it? It's been a totally screwed up situation. We have no comprehension of that part of the world. We don't want to have any comprehension. I don't think we care about very much about the people who live there. Um, we care about the oil that is there, of course. Um, but I think that in the West, generally, we've grown used to dominating this region politically, socially, perhaps even religiously to some degree, culturally, and of course now militarily on a huge scale. I mean, Western forces in some form or another, you know, French air bases, American Marines or whatever, are now in Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Turkey, um, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Algeria. Uh, they're in Bahrain, they're in Yemen, they're in Kuwait, they're in Qatar, they're in Oman. I mean, what on earth are we doing with our military forces in all these Muslim countries, you know? Uh, and no wonder you find people who, like bin Laden who say they're a crusader force. No wonder the Arabs agree. They see this massive force. I mean, I calculated for our Sunday magazine some months ago that we now have 22 times as many Western forces in the Muslim world than the Crusaders had in 12th century Islam. But it's, it's not just the present day, is it? I mean, the, the, this, this is a historical yeah, of course, thing. Look, I, I, it, you, can go, you, you can start this in the uh, dot, or you can start it with the Old Testament or Islam or wherever. I tend to start it in the First World War mm. because um, uh, my father, who is much older uh, than my mum, uh, he was a soldier in the very end months. Well, obviously, he survived, or I wouldn't be here. Uh, but um, he was on the Somme, Third Battle of the Somme, 1918. And in 17 months that followed his war, the victors, who were principally Britain and France, drew the borders of Northern Ireland, Yugoslavia, and most of the Middle East. And I've spent my entire career in Belfast and Bosnia and Beirut, Belgrade, we journalists like Onomatopoeia, um, watching the people in these borders burn. And I think that if you go back to the First World War, the British made two promises. Uh, they gave a promise to the Jews of the world that they would support a Jewish homeland in Palestine, which was to become a British mandate after the First World War. And they told the Arabs who supported the British in Lawrence of Arabia in fighting the Ottoman Turks, who were allies of the Germans, that they would have an independent Arab empire. And the two promises totally conflict. And of course, promises are meant to be kept. So I think to a considerable extent, uh, the British with the French as a number two, we created this mess. And then the Americans inherited it quite enthusiastically because they were very happy to see the end of the British Empire. And now we have a similar situation with America supporting primarily one nation, Israel, and not the others, except that they love the oil, um, wanting to run a peace process, but while doing so, giving unconditional total commitment to the state of Israel financially and militarily. Uh, talking constantly about the need for Israel's security, and it does deserve security, but not the security of Palestinians or Arabs. Uh, if you put that incendiary issue into the middle of the wider um, feelings of oppression of the Muslim world under our military invasions and occupations, I mean, invasion and occupation is exactly what we did to Iraq, which in, in the eyes of many Arabs is, is the crown jewels, because as Arab countries either have oil and no water, or water and no oil. Iraq is the only Arab country that has both, and we're there. I know that George Bush has pulled out 8,000 uh, American troops out of Iraq. They'll go to Afghanistan soon, though, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the fact that there's, there is likely to be a change in administration in the US. Is that going to change anything? You know what? I've done 32 years in the Middle East, as you said, and every time there's a presidential election, the Arabs say, oh, there'll be a new Democrat, a Republican, he'll sort the problem out, then they'll be fair. No, look, the, nothing is going to change, believe me. And it, it'll be the same old scenario. Before the presidential election, the candidate goes to Israel and then makes it clear who, who's America's most favored nation in the Middle East. Then the officials say, well, actually, Bob, you know, it'll change afterwards. He has to do this to get elected. And afterwards, there'll be a war of some kind, Hezbollah or Israel, I don't know. And, the American president will call upon both sides to exercise restraint while, of course, channeling more money and dollars and weapons into Israel if they're at war. And then it'll be a midterm election, so it'll be the same thing all over again. Nothing will change, and nothing will change. But it's, it's an almost impossible situation. I, I've, I've interviewed Israeli journalists mm. um, who 
are, they say, this is our land. This land was given to us by God. Yeah. We have been here for 2,000, 3,000 years, mm -hmm. and the Palestinians, the Johnny Come Latelys, who came in after we left. Well, that's not actually true, but the, the real issue, it, you put your finger on it. And I, I mean, I know lots of Israeli journalists, and the best one, by the way, is Amira Haas. And she actually lives among Palestinians in Ramallah. The problem when you go there, when you go to the West Bank, is there is a palace, I, I've actually filmed this for, for Discovery Channel and Channel 4 in, in Britain, there is a Palestinian whose family has been on that land for 300 years. They've got their Ottoman deeds, they've got their British mandate deeds, they've got their passports, their family's passports going way back. They showed that they showed taxes for their olive groves to the Turkish Ottoman. And the Israelis come along and say, and this has actually happened in one particular place I investigated, and said, I'm sorry, here's an order for you to get out. This is a new housing scheme for Israelis, of course, not for Arabs, and you can go off and live with your family somewhere else. And the guy says, but I've got the deeds. And of course, what happens is if you go and talk to the settlers, Israelis who move in on this man's land, which they're taking from him, um, you've got a guy who says, look, I've got my land deeds. It's all true and I'm legal. And the other guy, the settler says, maybe, but God gave this to us. Now, once you say that God decided it, there's no more discussion, is there? No compromise, no discussion, no peace, nothing. I mean, I can come along to your house and say, actually, I, I can prove to you that God gave me your back lawn, but you're not going to give it to me. No, but I'm going to take it anyway, and I've got the power to take it. And then, of course, if you throw a stone at me, you're a terrorist. It's an intractable situation. Uh, as long as you have this thing about deciding that God decides real estate, yes, you have a problem. Let's talk a bit about Osama bin Laden, because unlike most of this us... This guy is going to follow me around as an <laughs> albatross. Because you, you're the only person who's interviewed him three times. Yeah, I know. I mean... Mm. <sighs> Almost four times. His, Too many bombs. <laughs> I mean, at one stage, he was talking about you becoming a Muslim. No. Well, I think it, it was more serious than that, much more dangerous. The last time I saw him, uh, he walked into the tent in his camp, a camp originally built, of course, by the CIA because he was fighting for us then, fighting the Russians for us. Um, he said, Mr. Robert, one of our brothers had a dream, and I was surrounded by sort of armed Al-Qaeda people sort of looking at me. <laughs> And uh, anyway, um, Bin Laden said, one of our brothers had a dream in which he saw you dressed in a turban and a long robe like us, riding on a horse, and this means you are a true Muslim. And I was terrified because I thought he's trying to yeah. recruit me. Not, I mean, whether he thought he could make me into a Muslim or not is not the point. Anyway, I'm unconvertible. My religion is journalism. And um, uh, I thought, what do I say to this? Because if I say, well, you know, Screw you, Mr. Bin Laden, <laughs> you're dreaming, you know, it's not real. It's a very um, dangerous thing to do. So what I said is, actually, I'm not a Muslim. I'm a journalist, and my job is to tell the truth. And, of course, Al-Qaeda people are going, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and mercifully, Bin Laden, who realized he was stuck and I was trying to help him out, he said, that is the same as being a Muslim. So then we moved on to politics. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I felt very strongly afterwards, and I've never... Um, thrown away the deep suspicion that it was an attempt to see if he could recruit me. Your book, despite the trouble in it, has laugh out loud moments in it. There, there are times <laughs> when I found myself just laughing. Mm. How do you maintain that humor? Oh, I've got a natural sense of humor. I probably am quite a tough person. You know, if you work in the Middle East, you have to take the sticks and stones, sometimes literally. Uh, my mum and dad had quite a good sense of humour, although as he grew older, my father became a very right-wing, cantankerous, rather racist man. And I didn't go and see him when he was dying, I'm afraid. And probably in my last book, there was a whole chapter on him in the First World War, which might be my way of saying, sorry, I'm not sure. I'm still thinking, thinking, thinking about that one. <laughs> um, but um, no, I don't think you can survive amid sort of hell disaster of a place like the Middle East unless you have a very cynical, sharp and black sense of humour. Uh, which can be a source of some satisfaction sometimes, especially when you write like it. Yeah, Robert, long may you continue writing. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, you're welcome.